Hello and a warm welcome to this CIPR Scotland event. I'm Claire Slipper, I am Vice Chair of CIPR Scotland and we are really pleased that you've joined us today for this um, event on showcasing Scotland's food and drink, which is the first event in CIPR Scotland's 2022 series and helpfully coincides with uh, Burns Week. Um, so it's great to have you along with us today and thank you for listening in if you're catching up with this event um, afterwards. Uh, just to give a bit of background, the CIPR Scotland brings together a community of over 600 professionals working in the industry and we're pleased to be here to support you in your continued professional development. This event is worth five CIPR CPD points which can be logged on the CPD website after the event and you can also join in the debate on Twitter using the hashtag CIPR Scotland events. We will be recording today's session and a link will be made available afterwards to catch up. So in today's event, we'll be hearing from two individuals who are at the top of their game in devising communication strategies in one of Scotland's most exciting sectors, Scottish food and drink. Now, as we all know, Scotland food and drink is well renowned and continues to grow as a major sector in the Scottish economy. Um, so I'm sure that you, like me, are really enthusiastic to learn about this great Scottish success story um, so that you can have a think about what tools and measures we can all adapt in our own practice of communications in our own organisations. Our panel will share their insights on developing multifaceted campaigns in a fast moving sector, um, touching on how we can utilise effective PR and public affairs and digital communications to showcase Scotland's larder and have impact. So with that in mind, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome along John Davidson, who is Deputy Chief Executive and Strategy Director of Scotland Food and Drink, and Fraser Grieve, who is Deputy Director of Strategy and Communications at the Scotch Whiskey Association. And uh, just before we kick off, if you do have any questions for our panel, please um, use the chat function and we'll try to get through as many as we can through today's session. So um, I suppose in, in kicking off, John and Fraser, thanks for joining us. Um, at CIPR Scotland, we're, we're really interested to hear about people's journey into the industry. Um, so I'd just like to start by asking you both a general question about how you ended up doing what you're doing now. Um, Fraser, we'll start with you, if that's okay. Uh, yeah, so I mean, I started off uh, in politics for my sins, um, doing sort of campaigns, communications, a bit of bag carrying. Um, so I uh, did that over a decade. Um, fascinating work, really enjoyed it, um, starting out in Edinburgh and then up in Inverness. Um, then moved to the, the sort of business organisation, SCDI, uh, covering the Highlands and Islands and really got a big feel for the different types of businesses and industries that took place in, in, in that region. Um, and Food and Drink was a, a pretty key one, working with big brands, Baxters, Walkers, lots of whiskey companies too. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the lure of whiskey and working for that iconic industry was just too great uh, and too good an opportunity to miss. So uh, yeah, I jumped into it and it's been, uh, it's been an interesting two years so far but uh, very much enjoyable. Great, thank you. And, and John, how did you end up at, at Scotland Green Drink? Hi, thank you and thanks everyone. Um, so I have been at Scotland Food and Drink for about a year and a half now. And uh, for those who don't know, Scotland Food and Drink is an industry body. Um, we have 430 members, so we look after their interests. And the other thing we do is have this leadership role across the industry to try and drive forward growth. Um, and what we do. So, you know, that's about how we enhance our reputation, highlight critical issues and how we tell our story uh, to inspire business. Um, so I've came into this Scotland Food and Drink for a year and a half after a 24 year life in the Scottish government. So a little bit different, uh, other way around perhaps. So a long time in the government working in different areas. Um, but the last 10 years has probably shaped where I am today in terms of for the, for the last of those five, I, I was in food and drink and therefore working very closely with the sector and understanding it and, and, and the people within it. But before that, I spent five years as a cabinet secretary's private secretary in the Scottish government. So that was a fascinating time and a fascinating insight for me, particularly around communications and the effectiveness of that. And that is because that was at a time when the Scottish independence referendum was happening, referendum was happening, and also the EU referendum. So for that two, three, four year period, being really at the heart of government and thinking about communications at a really charged political time and the importance of that, uh, you know, really opened my eyes to, to, to how that needs to be done effectively. So that journey from government 
now into industry has been really interesting for me. So I've got two different perspectives here of, you know, influencing government policy, but also trying to work with stakeholders externally. And it's interesting to see the different perspectives um, um, from there. Yeah, absolutely. And how, how did you find that transition from being working within government to then working, well, I, I mean, not lobbying, but, you know, kind of making representation, representations to the government? Was that was that an interesting transition? Yeah, it has been. It has been really interesting. And, um, you know, there's a lot of similarities, actually, between what I did in the government and how the government functions. Uh, and how where I work in the industry and how that functions. Uh, so there are similarities, but there's differences. And you know, on the one hand, I feel more, I, I feel, I guess, less constrained now to say what I think. Uh, you know, when you work for the government and ultimately, you know, at the behest of ministers, and you are very careful about what you say, clearly, constantly, always. Uh, I feel less constrained now. But that said, because of the nature of how we go about our business, the type of organisation we are you know, we still need to be fairly constrained. Um, so it has been, the dynamic has been interesting. You know, um, I think, you know, being willing and able to speak up more forcefully for our members, irrespective of what government we're talking to or who we're talking to, is critical for what we do. So, you know, I've had to probably be a bit braver uh, and come out and just be a bit smarter in terms of what I, um, how you pick and choose your battles. But, you know, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting transition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose that kind of leads me into the next question, really. I mean, obviously, you're you're both very involved in in kind of setting some of that overall strategic direction for the sector, which which is a big part of the Scottish economy. And how big a part would you say that effective communications plays in that? And, and by communications, I mean you know PR and media relations, but the, the public affairs stuff as well. Fraser, do you want to start on that one? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really important. I think people underestimate uh, the economic contribution of, uh, of food and drink, the jobs it supports, um, what it does for Scotland as a brand in terms of people's recognition uh, of what Scotland offers. I think people too often walk into a supermarket, see what's on the shelf, and don't think about the provenance, all of the effort and skill that's gone into it. Um, and certainly from a, a Scotch whisky point of view, the centuries that it's taken to build up that reputation and global regard, and I think we have a duty to be custodians um, of the of the sector to make sure that we are not doing anything to to harm it, um, and that we continue to to build that that reputation because it's it's hard fought. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with that completely, and and actually. Um, you know, communications has always been important to what we do as an industry, um, um, depending on who we're trying to talk to, whether it's politicians or whether it's consumers uh, or whether it's our own membership. But I think on the back of the last two years, which have been really difficult for many parts of the industry, um, how we communicate now and certainly over the next year or two is even more fundamental and more important. So how we think about our recovery, how we think about... Uh, our clarity of message that we want people to understand. I mean, Fraser talked about our brand there and the importance of that and our reputation. And, and there's no doubt that's fantastic in certain places, but in other places it's not. So how do we, you know, use our communication channels and message and techniques to really drive home that message that we want people to understand? So I think it's even more important now on the back of COVID and Brexit and where we go over the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do you think it is about Scottish food and drink that does have such an appeal and, and what, what more can we do to kind of get these messages out to the sort of wider general public about about the provenance um, and everything else that it delivers? I think for me what, what is that about Scotland food and drink that doesn't have an appeal? Um, it's a, a fantastic uh, sector, it's a brilliant uh, basket of, of products and you know in terms of uh, of Scotch whisky, it's got that long-standing heritage, that tremendous global mm. reputation. Um, and I think we have to, to be very careful about how we continue to evolve meats, sort of changing trends, um, whilst making sure that we don't throw things out uh, with the bathwater in terms of some of that change, that sort of evolution, um, whilst holding on to some of the, the traditional practices. So I think it's never resting on our loyal laurels, always making sure that we are innovating, looking for new stuff, that we are meeting what consumers want, which I think is 
more and more about providence, about sustainability, um, about the stories of where their food and drink comes from. And I think we have a, a real opportunity to do a lot more in that space. I mean, I would completely echo that. And actually, um, I, I think we have a lot of work to do, actually, in, in terms of uh, our story, in Scotland in particular. Um, so, you know, we have a fantastic industry here, so important to Scotland, but particularly rural Scotland and coastal areas in particular, where there's a lot of employment. Um, and that, th the offer of what we have here is well understood, actually, internationally often. It's really interesting. But I think in Scotland, it's probably, there's probably more that needs to be done around consumer engagement and with young people and families and others, just around the quality of our produce, the diversity of our produce, and what that means in terms of supporting local jobs, et cetera. Um, I think sometimes we take for granted a little bit what we have, and I do think that cultural piece of what we have here, uh, how we use our land, you know, our generations of farmers and fishermen, et cetera, I do think we need to probably do a bit better. It's just that that pride and where it comes from, that understanding where food comes from, from a very young age, it's difficult, but I think we need to work harder at that. So, you know, that has to be something collectively where we need to think about how we can do a bit more just to embed that culture. We look at other countries and I think other countries do that really well. You know, Italy, France do that very well. So how, how can we just do a bit more, build on the good work that we already do? Yeah, I can totally recognise that. I mean, I'm, I'm wondering about your perspective on uh, the fact that, you know, food and drink production is, is to a large extent, is quite a traditional industry. It's, it's a primary industry. And um, I mean, are, are we facing a slightly uncomfortable rub along with, with that story, which is, you know, is a fantastic piece and you know, part of our heritage and the need to innovate and become more sustainable and meet what are quite stretching net zero targets, for example, is that is that going to produce difficulty for the sector or is that an opportunity as communicators? Um, I mean, I think sustainability is a, a hugely important thing. I mean, as a as an industry, Scotch whisky has to take a very long term view, you know, it takes a minimum of three years uh, to, to make the product um, and to, to let it mature. So uh, we have to take that long term view. We want to to really be a leader in the, the sort of drive to, to net zero. It's why the SWA are race to zero partners. It's why many of our members have committed to, to pretty stringent uh, sustainability targets because, you know, we, we have our own commitments, government are, are making their efforts, but ultimately I think consumer preference will drive this to go a lot faster than it has been. Um, and so it's, it's not a case of not doing it, you've, you've got to really go, go for it and, and really make that a key part of your story and your narrative. Um, and I think going back to, to what John said earlier, you know, we have this global reputation, you know, Scotch whisky can only be made in one country, um, but has to, to compete with, with other products around the world. Um, you know, maybe what 4% of Scotch whisky sales are uh, in Scotland. Um, we fill a, a shipping container every four minutes um, for, for export um, and it's enjoyed in around 180 um, countries um, in, in the world. And, and we have to be very mindful that, you know, we are made in Scotland, we are a big part of the, the story, um, but it's not our key market. We, we play a, an important role, particularly around tourism and that, that story, but, but we need to not be insular in terms of how we, we view this and, and, and play that part. And, and really make sure that we are being seen to and really acting in, in the sustainability space. I, I think um, just building on that, um, you know, we have sold our products in terms of how we communicate and market ourselves, generally speaking, uh, on our quality, on our provenance and our heritage story. Um, that is how we have communicated to our markets and, and the buyers and, and consumers generally. The angle now around sustainability is really important. And as, as Fraser says, consumers, consumer demand is driving that. But that is new territory for many, many businesses across the industry. Um, the, the Scotch whisk industry has been pushing sustainability for a long, long time, and they're leading the way. Uh, and others are, are probably starting to catch up. But because of COP uh, and, and just the way society is going, the focus on sustainability and environmental credentials is greater than ever. And I think how we then as an industry start talking about this in the same way as we've talked about 
or other credentials, quality, provenance, etc., is really important. But I think that's not easy. You know, we are some businesses are only on their journey. There's some businesses are doing fantastic stuff, but many other businesses are on their journey. So how we, you know, we are thinking in Scotland Food Drink, how can we help businesses with our with our narrative, with our messages? Uh, how do we stand out from the crowd? I mean, we actually think Scotland can be the home of climate friendly food production. You know, we've got all the attributes here to do that. But how do we tell that story in a compelling way? In a right way, of course, backed up with businesses doing what they need to be doing on this journey. So I think this is definitely a new focus for us going forward. It could potentially be one of the main focuses, particularly in some markets where this is really important. Um, but we need to help businesses in terms of that narrative and how compelling that can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, thinking about your, your membership, are there any brands or, or organisations within, within the companies that, that you represent who are doing a particularly good job of marketing themselves really well? And is there anyone that we could be looking to for, for best practice in terms of the way that they're telling that story and getting that narrative out there? We can't ask us who our favourite child is. I mean, that's a, that's a bit <laughs> harsh. Um, obviously, we love all Scotch whisky companies. They all uh, uh, have an important message to do. I mean, I think, you know, they are all in, in different spaces. I think what some of them have been doing, particularly in the sort of ultra premium space, um, the sort of 60, 70, 80 year old whiskies, and, and really talking about that heritage piece, I think that that plays a, a really important part in that heritage, long lasting story point of view. I think um, you've, got, you've got Johnny Walker Blue Label in terms of their particular marketing in China and their, their sort of dragon designs, I think is really interesting. I think the, the sort of traditional versus edginess of some uh, Scotch whiskey brands and expressions, I think is really interesting and I mean I think it's it's something we try and balance you know we have to look after and safeguard the, the reputation of of Scotch whiskey and make sure that people understand that everything is beating the rules but yet that joy of seeing some of the edginess and, and, and attempt to appeal to different markets and making sure that we are as reflective of the diversity and inclusion of the marketplace is, is really key and I think more and more brands are being a bit braver um and i think it's how do we how do we support that and, and encourage that whilst being cautious that we don't overstep the mark and never put what is a tremendous industry and a tremendous sector at risk um from over promising or not being clear about what what is in place and i think we we try and strike that balance but i think there's some really fascinating innovations taking place and i think across the whole spectrum of of young and edgy to, to ultra premium, uh, some fascinating stories. Yeah. And I think a slightly different perspective, Claire, on, on who's leading the way and who's doing well. Um, one of the things we always think about in Scotland Food and Drink is, um, yes, we're a leadership organisation um, and we like to think creatively, um, but where can we learn from others? And who else is doing very well? Um, and we, you know, we're not ashamed to replicate or, or, or learn from or even copy to an extent. And, you know, I keep coming back to our friends in Ireland who um, are, have a fantastic story around their sustainability credentials in terms of their food production. Um, and we look at that, we look at what they've done, we look at their communication channels, we look at their creativity and how they do that and how they tell that story. And we think we need to be learning from that. You know, we, we do, we're doing some fantastic work in Scotland and we're leading the way in many ways, but where we can learn from others who are doing good stuff uh, it's important we do. So, you know, there's, there's great stuff going on in Scotland, but it's also how we look beyond our borders, look at others who are telling the story well, doing well, and how can we learn and adapt and refine our own message, um, but learning from what's worked well from, from them. So our friends in Ireland are doing extremely good work in this space, and no doubt we will, we will, we will try and learn as best as we can. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, but always leading from the front. <laughs> um, I suppose... So to go into a bit more of the nitty gritty, I suppose, in your in your day to day work, uh, I'm interested to to learn a bit more about you know the actual balance of um of kind of different communications that you use. So I mean, I'm I'm assuming that you know political dialogue will will obviously play a, a key part in working with policymakers and regulators. Um, but but how much is kind of having a good a good media profile um or or a good digital profile um is there anything you know any insights you have to share there and and or has it been impacted at all by the situation of the last two years with 
with COVID? I think um, in terms of that, I think trying to understand and know your audience is always really important. So I tend to do more in the, the sort of political engagement lobbying space. Um, but I think understanding what people are interested in around your product. So if we, we look at Scotch Whiskey, you know, it's a massive economic contributor, 5.5 billion pounds in GBA. It's a massive tourism asset, you know, well, ignore uh, 2020, but, you know, uh, 2.1 million visitors to distilleries, two and three visitors being international. Uh, we're a big part of Scotland's exports, as I say, filling a shipping container every four minutes, a container ship every 25 days. Um, so I think it's about understanding that whilst also knowing that consumers that go to our website tend to just want to know about distilleries and some nice cocktails um, and who your followers are on Twitter, on LinkedIn and, and Instagram and, and what they are looking for. So it's about how do we reinforce the campaign messages we are wanting to get across, how do we respond to World Whiskey Day, Burns Night, um, other events like that, that, that we are sort of part of that mix. So I think it's it's knowing the, the breadth of what we do, focusing in as much as possible on when the, the right timing is, and uh, hopefully communicating to, to people in a way that's relevant to them. And for our perspective, uh, profile is important, is really important. So, um, you know, Scotland Food and Drink, for example, on our social media platforms on Twitter, uh, we have over 40,000 followers, which is quite a big following. Uh, we are very fortunate that our chief executive, James Withers, also has a very uh, big profile. Uh, so, you know, his, his followers is, is 25,000. Uh, and, you know, that that profile is important to us because why is that important to us? It allows us to communicate very widely with a whole range of individuals. Um, it allows us to think about how we gain more members. So the bigger profile we've got, the more reach we have, the more member, the more people are interested in us, the more people may be willing to join us. And that membership is important to our function and what we do. Uh, the more followers we have, the 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 more weight that brings to our conversations that we're having with politicians and others around trying to influence. Um, and linked to that, you know, when we are doing campaigns, whether it's consumer facing or whether it's a, uh, an influence, a political strategy, um, we will have a range of metrics in terms of what that means and who, how, how far that's reached. And that is important to us. It is very, very important in terms of playing back to our members, uh, justifying their membership fee to us, um, and ultimately, you know, our existence. So these things are important. Um, can we, is there more channels that we could possibly use? Um, uh, new channels uh, to extend their reach and have maximise their impact? Probably, yes, I think there probably is. We want to develop and learn all the time. So we have a really solid core, I would say, in terms of how we do it. But we're always wanting to learn. We always want to do new things. We want to, always want to think out the box. But, but yes, it is very important to what we do. And, and is there anything that, that you've had to, to do to adapt, you know, to the situation with home working, et cetera, over the last two years with COVID um, that has been particularly different or has had a particularly good response, for example? Uh, I mean, in terms of our engagement, we've had to do a lot more in the virtual space. Um, you know, hacks, um, hybrid uh, whiskey events aren't quite the same as being in the, the same room, uh, but we've, we've done what we could in that kind of space. Um, I mean, we have seen a big change in consumer trends um, over the period. I think um, people, you know, unable to go out and enjoy hospitality, um, do more cocktail making at home, uh, less but better in terms of, uh, of consumption um, in the, the sort of drinks and spirits space. Uh, so I think there has been that, that sort of bit more interest in sort of high-end drinks and do do cocktails and, and different things there um, and try to, as I say, replicate that kind of difference. And I think people doing a bit more research about where, where things come from, how it's made. And yeah, I think that will, will be a sort of lasting thing that the provenance story, the, um, the authenticity, they're trying to get a better grip of, of why they're buying it. It's a, 
a more competitive space um, because more people are wanting to, to delve in and understand your product in a way that they previously didn't when they just nipped into the supermarket and went, you'll do, you're the cheapest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from our perspective, in terms of our internal communications with our members, so that's changed massively over the last two years because of what we what we saw, and we've had to think quite carefully about how we do that. So, you know, one of the things that Scotland Food Drink has always done well is bringing people together uh, for conferences and events, and um, we, it's an opportunity for us to engage with our members and others to hopefully inspire them, to tell them what's happening, to hear from them about some of the issues, and of course that's all been lost over the last two years. So, you know, we've had to be quite smart in terms of how we've adapted to that and how we have pivoted to using technology, like everyone else, to make sure we are still engaging with our members, we're listening to them, we're communicating with them. So, you know, there's very traditional ways that that's been done just in terms of how we use our direct mail shots to them, our newsletters, you know, how we use uh, short films to get our message across, how we bring people together in a virtual sense. So we have, we have had to probably, I wouldn't say think terribly, you know, we've not been massively creative in terms of how we've done that, but we've had to do it more often and we've just had to be quite smart. And I think the related thing is uh, uh, how we've had to be crystal clear with our messaging. So, you know, um, people are so busy. Businesses, our members are just found the last two years really challenging producing food and just keeping the lights on. So if we want them to listen to something and respond to something or give us a view, how do we do that and make that ask in as few words as we can? Yeah. Um, and that's so that we've had to think really carefully about that because, you know, it's easy for us to write a, a long document for people to, to read over. But actually, if we only have a couple of sentences where we really need to grab their attention, how do we do that? So that's made us think differently in terms of internally, think a bit harder, you know, being really crystal clear with our focus for our message. So those are just things that have Good, been good for us over the last two years, good disciplines for us to have, and no doubt going forward we'll continue to, you know, have that mindset as, as we get back to a normal. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm just interested in terms of how you do that. I mean, would that be, if you're needing kind of quick fire response from members to how they're responding to stuff, would that just be a single mail shop that you send out regularly? Or, you know, would, would you be utilising things like Twitter polls and, you know, other kind of more digital tools? Yeah, from our perspective, it's a bit of both. Um, I said earlier on, we have a we have an, quite an enormous reach on Twitter, so we can use Twitter um, and LinkedIn for for a for a number of ways to help us just get instant views from people. Uh, and it, it's not scientific, but it does gauge the temperature. It does give you that sense of what are people feeling just now. Now, there's always risk with that. Of course, there is. There's always people on social media who are more than willing to give their opinion, and it's not very well informed. So, you know, we need to always. Uh, balance what we're hearing through these instant polls or, or 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 sort of emotionally charged comments back we hear from our followers on Twitter versus I guess just having really good insight and relationships um, with, with some people we trust and know and we can communicate directly with them because of those relationships that we've built and I think that's something that we that we really um, we take really seriously and important to us in terms of how we develop that relationship both individually and collectively which enables us to think about uh, how we then communicate in the future through different ways. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I mean, it's, it's um, I think often people can see the social media stuff as, as an, an add-on or as a, you know, just something to stick out to sort of market a new campaign or a new product, but actually using it as a tool in which to develop a two-way discussion and relationships is is really, yeah, quite interesting. Yeah, absolutely. So bear, bearing that in mind, um, and hopefully as we are now moving out of the, the shadow of the pandemic, although I'm sure that those words have probably been uttered uh, too many times in the last two years. Um, what trends do you think that we will start to see emerging in marketing Scotch whisky and, and kind of wider Scotch food and drink? Uh, I mean, I think, as I say, provenance, sustainability, authenticity, really tying those down, uh, making people sure people can really trust uh, how their product is made, where it's from, um, and that story behind uh, Scotch whisky and I think broader food and drink will become more pressing. And I think, um, you know, we've not mentioned the, the B word, but I think particularly for food, um, telling that quality story um, is, is far more important now, given the, the price challenges that, that exist in the marketplace. So I think, I think that is really key um, and making sure that people really trust you 
um, and make and everything builds on that. So you know, we do a lot to protect Scotch whisky around the world, make sure that uh, imitations and, and fakes um, aren't on the marketplace for for long if they they pop up and that, that people can trust that they pick up a, a bottle of Scotch whisky as a, a genuine bottle of Scotch whisky. But we want to do a lot more about that storytelling piece um, and track that. We know there's a huge heritage story. We know that people go, oh gosh, my grandfather used to work at Talasker Distillery and they go there and they get a sense, the smell of the sound of the sea and all of that kind of bit. So, so that imagery piece, and I think going back to uh, to John's point about the, the digital space and the, the videos and all of that, mm -hmm. people in food and drink love telling stories about themselves, about yeah. their businesses, about their products. And I think we need to give them a lot more opportunity to do that because I think people want to hear that. They want to have that, that connection so it's not so transactional uh, as it was before. So I think that's probably one of the biggest shifts that people want to, to know and trust you in a way that didn't happen before. Uh, and it's much easier to know if people are lying to you if a product isn't up to scratch. Yeah. There's a, there's a, that is spot on what Fraser said and I'd echo all of that. Um, there's, an, there's another flip side though to a trend that's happening this year, which we're quite thoughtful about and particularly in the context of a communications response and strategy around this, which is a more defensive piece on food and drink in Scotland from a producer perspective. So what do I mean by that? So there's the one hand we tell a very positive story as Fraser's um, set out and we need to do that. But on the flip side, what's happening in the market in the UK is really interesting just now. So there's enormous pressure on prices, on household prices, people are struggling, energy prices, uh, cost of living is high, uh, pay increases might not be coming, keeping pace with that. And there's going to be food inflation. We're already seeing that. So there's enormous pressure what then we're going to see is a debate about food prices in the UK yeah. and what that means. And we're already seeing signs of that and some people looking at the price of food and potentially saying it's expensive and people can't afford to buy certain foods, etc. Now, that is a really interesting debate to have in this country. It's a really complex debate around, uh, you know, whether it's social inclusion, poverty, etc. But the context here is that the UK has the most competitive retail market anywhere in the world. So what I mean by that is there's more retailers in the UK than anywhere else in the world, uh, all competing for shelf space and all competing to keep prices low for consumers so they retain market share. So that's the context. The way that is happening just now is in the desire to keep prices as low as they can, uh, the pressure is on producers to maintain their margins, and lower their margins. So that is a fundamental challenge for producers up and down Scotland who are supplying the retail market. We all want reasonably priced food, but because of the nature of the UK retail market and the desire to keep prices low as they can be, that's putting put enormous pressure on consumers. So there's a debate happening just now around food prices, mm -hmm. and it's very complex. So the communication challenge for us, I think, going forward this year is recognizing those challenges, but how do we contribute to that debate from a consumer perspective, from a producer perspective, sorry, understand, making people understand what it means to be a producer, the pressures that con uh, producers are also facing with the cost of increases in raw materials and, and energy costs and, and staff costs, uh, and the pressure that then puts on how you sell your product into a retailer and what that means for your margin, coming back uh, and ultimately be able to sustain a business. So that is a very complex debate and an interesting debate, but that is going to be a big challenge for us this year in terms of how we uh, put forward uh, and make people understand, help people understand the producer perspective and all this. Mm -hmm. So that is not an easy debate to have, but that is going to be a debate probably in 2022 that we will need to contribute to through various communication channels um, and you know it's really important to think about our message and get the tone right and and help help inform that debate. Yeah, yeah, that's that's really interesting because I think I think you said at the, at the start there, John, that we can't we can't take for granted support for the sector or 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 indeed you, the amount of awareness that there is for the sector. And I think sometimes sometimes these debates actually are a lot more complex than than they appear at face value. And 
as we all know, you know, when communicating stories or, or running campaigns, you want to keep it simple and keep it top line so that it's memorable um, and so that people get it. So, I mean, do you have any tips as to how you, um, and not to put you on the spot here, but do you have any tips as to how you kind of make a debate like that a bit more accessible and easy to understand for your average reader or consumer? It's a, it's a great question. Um, so you just actually said the first thing I would say, which is um, keeping it simple. I think generally speaking, we can have a tendency to overcomplicate things and, and we're, you know, we all like to sound intelligent and, 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 and stuff, but I think how we keep it simple so people can, reson can relate to it and resonate with it, I think is critical going forward with that. I think the other angle that I would always be thinking about here is um, voices contributing to this debate. So, you know, me, James Withers, other industry leaders can have this debate, but actually, what about the producer voice? The producer voice um, telling the story, what it's like for them, run the business and the challenges they have, who are also consumers, you know, finding that right voice, that appropriate voice to just bring to life some of these issues that we're talking about is really important. So, you know, I'd always be thinking about the simplicity of our message. I'd be thinking about the impact of this message. So how can I make this message as impactful as I can, as it can be? How can I make the reader either be shocked or make the reader just say, wow, I, I never realised that. So what is that? How do, we, how do we create something that just gives that impact? And the third strand is who tells that story? Is it actually better having a producer voice or an alternative voice telling that story rather than someone like me? So those are the things that I'd be thinking about, you know, when trying to deliver a message out there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's really useful. Thanks, John. We've actually, it kind of ties into a question that we've just had come in by the Q&A here, uh, which says that's an interesting point about food prices, but, but what is a reasonable price? And how do we get people to appreciate that they need to pay a reasonable amount for decent food? Um, our food prices are the cheapest in Europe, and we just don't seem to value good food as much as in other countries. Um, would, would you have a, a response to that or just nodding along in agreement? <laughs> no, listen, uh, I don't know who asked the question, but uh, you know, it's, it's, a great, it's a great question and well put. And, and the right, the, so the UK's food prices on average are the third lowest in the world. So uh, your, your question said the first in Europe, so that'll be right. Um, and again, I don't think that's recognised. So the fundamental question here is about how we value food and how the society here in the UK values the food, you know, and, and retail has done a tremendous job for promoting Scottish food and drink, uh, giving us more choice on our shelves. There's no doubt about that. We work so closely with retailers and they've done great work for us. But the nature of the, the, nature of the, uh, of the retail environment is meaning that the desire to keep food prices low is there. It's very real. And, and, and consumers have therefore came to expect that. Uh, and, there's, and there is therefore a debate around what is reasonable. You know, a bag of carrots were being sold at Christmas for 10 pence or eight pence, I think, in some of them. You know, when we think of the work that goes in from our primary producer to grow those carrots and then, you know, and then all the packaging and the processing of those carrots, it goes in behind that, yet the carrots have been sold for eight pence. So there is definitely a conversation to be had about the value of food in this country and the story that goes behind that, I think. So it's a, it's a great question um, and it's whether society wants to have that debate. But I think 2022 could be a time when we have this debate because of the, the, the external factors that are out there. I, I think it's a really good debate to be had. Um, it's a shame that we're having it at a time when there is pressure um, on, on primary producers and it would have been nice to have this debate when there wasn't that pressure and people had a bit more, more choice. I mean, I think one of the, the challenges is in the UK, there is a huge dominance of supermarkets that naturally drives cost and convenience uh, in the marketplace and, and makes it harder for producers to tell their story. Um, you don't get the same number of green grocers and um, butchers on the, on the high street. And so you don't have that same connection. Um, you're not, you know, paying for Mary's family to have their meal or for John to, to meet up with on a, in the pub or whatever it is. You, you have a, a huge disconnect. You simply, it's very transactional. Um, and I think we need to, to do a bit more to tell the story about seasonality, um, about getting that balance right, um, telling the story about the, the quality um, and effort that goes into and the standards that are in UK food and drink um, in a way that doesn't. I mean, we, 
we don't want to compete for the lowest uh, price. That is that is not where we we should be. Uh, we're too high welfare for that. We have too high standards for that. But we need to do something to to tell people about the value of what is is on the shelf and, and why they should take it. And in that, we can't lose sight of the fact that for lots of people, they need food that is affordable. And we have to do something to, to make sure that in this debate, we are including all of society and really looking at how we make sure that uh, food and drink and anything they are needing to, to survive is accessible at a price that people can afford. Um, and if they can't afford it, how do we make it affordable to them? Um, and part of that might be the seasonality piece, part of it might be about how we use different cuts, different products, how we balance our, our menus and things like that. And you know, we, we have to look at all of these, these things in the, the round. Um, and that is challenging. It's a, I think it's a really positive debate. And I think the sustainability story that we're all looking to get into as we, we drive to, to net zero, that has a price. Um, and people will have to understand that if they they go and they want our product to, to meet certain sustainability requirements, if they want it to have high welfare, uh, these, these have a cost. Um, and we, we have to be quite honest and frank about that in the, in the discussion and not pretend that these, these are issues that, that people have to, to have a debate about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, how important would you say you know, relationships are with the media in getting some of these messages across? Um, do you do much proactive work in in having these discussions with with media or is it is it more of a kind of policy political focused discussion um, from our perspective um it, the media is important um and it'll and it'll be more important depending on the issue we're trying to influence so um last year um we ran a, 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 i think a very effective campaign around brexit um but and that was uh, channeled through the media so that's how we wanted to do it uh, so it was around the coming to the end of the when we, when we were actually even leaving the eu the uk was leaving the eu we wanted to highlight the challenges for food and drink industry for that we wanted to highlight some of the solutions that we want to see brought forward by governments and we developed a communication strategy delivered through the media for a you know a three to six month period uh, to raise the profile of this to try and garner some wider support to hopefully just influence ministers. So for that perspective, um, that was for that um, task, that was really important in terms of media. And we had a really clear strategy on what we wanted to do, the channels, the individuals in the media, and the tools we would deploy at certain times um, to do that. And, you know, by all accounts, that campaign, we'll call it, small campaign, uh, uh, was very effective. Now, did it ultimately change some of the big political decisions around Brexit? Probably not, but we never expected that. We, we, our expectations were reasonable at the start. Uh, and it was about how we raised a profile with UK ministers, how we start seeing some small changes, et cetera. So by all those metrics, it was successful. So to answer your question, Claire, the media for certain things and what we're trying to achieve is very important. And we will always try and develop quite a coherent strategy uh, for who we deploy and when we deploy it and what, we'll, what we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I'm keen to hear from Fraser, but but just as I suppose an, an add-on, do you find that the media landscape in Scotland is more receptive to that message or, uh, than than the wider UK media, or or is it roughly the same? Uh, for in the context of Brexit, we had a very uh, uh, a good relationship with media across the UK. Now I think that was because uh, Brexit was such a challenge. The media are looking for good stories. They're looking for a bit of sensational headlines. We can give them some of that stuff in terms of the challenges that we are seeing. So it was in their interest as well for us to help them uh, give good stories and good impactful sites and pictures, etc. Uh, I think generally, though, the Scottish media are very helpful to our cause in food and drink and what we're trying to do. Uh, they are very much behind the, the culture of what we're aspiring to. So I think you know, we are pushing an open door. It's just for us about when we want to communicate what that message is, you know, and the best routes that we do that. Yeah, I think just uh, following on from that, I think for, for one of our challenges is always a bit about perception. Um, Scotch whiskey, Scotland, 
rural, small distilleries, um, and changing that perfection going, you know, where 75% of Scotland food and drink, where uh, one fifth of UK food and drink, and over 1% of all uh, UK goods exported. So a pretty sizable um, uh, industry playing a part. And so we have to, to balance that sort of domestic messaging around real jobs and people and communities and the, the effort that goes into their versus being hugely international, um, responding to, to international media inquiries um, every week on, on different subjects um, and lots of queries around that. So we have to, to try and balance those two, two elements out as well as, you know, obviously pushing for fairer tax in the UK and uh, better um, tariff regime in India at the moment. And so balancing different campaigns, different audiences, and we have to be very mindful on that. I mean, I think in terms of of Brexit itself, um, I suppose we are we slightly different to um, food producers. Um, our products don't have a, a shelf life, um, and so we did a, a lot of planning ahead of Brexit and, and were prepared. And actually, you know, other than a couple of small issues, it hasn't had any real impact on us. Um, and we also are quite fortunate to be in a position that actually some of the, the trade deals. Um, being stuck around the world uh, have a have a potential positive for us, as I say, particularly India, Australia, New Zealand, others, uh, where we can see tariffs um, reduced or removed. And I think we have to be mindful about some of the, the discussions around Brexit being quite insular, protectionist, all of those kind of elements versus at the same time wanting to be international and for the rest of the world to buy our product and striking that balance is, is always going to be a bit of a bit of a challenge at, at points um but as long as we're positive and welcoming uh hopefully we'll we'll get there yeah i was going to ask about brexit actually i thought i couldn't really let the session slip past without mentioning the, the b word <laughs> Um, and having personally spent a lot of time working on that in my in my previous role, I can I can I really recognise a lot of what you both are saying. Um, I, I was going to ask about how Brexit has impacted the work that you do, but I suppose as as communicators, what's perhaps more interesting is any um, insights or reflections you can offer on um, how the Brexit negotiations might have changed your political work in terms of you know public affairs and and, and um, political advocacy and. Is there anything that we can learn moving forward in terms of how to effectively engage with governments um, from that experience? I think for, from our point of view, it's a you know it's a bit recognizing a vote has taken place and, and people have different uh, positions uh, that they, they took around it. And I think you know having had that decision, it's it's our job to try and make that work, um, try and make sure that we are supporting jobs, supporting the economy, and doing the best to, to, to grow out of any political decision. And I think we always have to be kind of mindful of that. Um, I mean, generally speaking, we, we try and look at what are the positives. How do we, how do we help politicians and, and others achieve a, a decision that is a, a positive outcome for them? Um, you know, it's much easier to get people to support good stuff and good initiatives than simply being opposed to, to bad stuff. Um, and I think trying to work in that space, do a lot more listening about why um, people take the, the positions they, they take, understand that, um, and as much as you can, try and and guide them as to, to why you take a slightly different viewpoint on an issue, or there is a, a sort of underlying um, challenge within within their viewpoint that can be overcome to, to as I say, make something uh, as positive uh, an outcome as possible, you know, politicians, everyone likes to win um, and giving them something that is is positive that they can hang their hat on and say, excellent, we did, we did well there, even if it wasn't what they originally had, had anticipated will always uh, help you through, I think. I mean, Brexit for us has been really interesting um, because it's forced us to think beyond Scotland more um, and think about those UK networks and who we're trying to influence in the UK from a communication perspective when we do that. Um, but what we've had to do a lot of work on over the past year is developing relations in England in particular to then give us the platform to communicate effectively and get our message across. 
So we never had, we ha of course we had some relations in England, but not as well established as probably uh, we now recognise we needed to be. So we had to develop and invest a lot of time in developing relationships, for example, with other trade bodies in England, uh, with maybe a polit particular politicians in England, um, uh, oh, and particular media um, uh, sort of partners in England, who we, we, we never really had a particularly strong relationship with. We had to invest time to develop a relationship so they can understand the context, can understand the challenges, which then allowed us to then communicate through them and with them about particular issues that we're trying to influence. So it was really interesting for us. You know, we couldn't just feel we, we approach people out cold and say, can you communicate with us or can you run this story for us? You might have a little bit of success, but by building relations in the background allowed us to lay the foundations for then running successful communication um, efforts. So, you know, it's been an interesting dialogue uh, um, for us over the past year in terms of building our own reputation and, and visibility in England to enable this to enable us to then think about how we communicate. Thank you for that. Um, before we move into our last few minutes, um, do for those listening, please do feel free to fire any final questions through the Q&A box or the chat box. Um, I suppose I'm just kind of in wrapping up, I'm keen just to ask a bit of a catch-all question. What do you think our members at CIPR Scotland and practitioners working in PR and public affairs, what do you think they can learn from the food and drink sector in terms of their communications practice? Uh, I think for me, it goes back to some of the things we've, we've touched on uh, throughout this. Be positive and tell a story. You know, tell the story of real people and real places and where your product service comes from and, and why people can connect to it on a more personal level. You know, people are always going to be more inclined to support or buy from or sign up to a real person um, or something, as I say, that they can connect to in a way that um, I think wasn't necessarily there before. Um, focus on what changes you want to achieve, um, how you, you get people um, aligned to that. Um, as I say, you know, selling good stuff rather than being opposed to bad stuff, uh, I think is, is really pretty important. So I think, uh, you know, stories, real people, um, content as much as, as possible, sort of digital content, really getting people in front of the camera and getting that sort of connection, um, because I think that really helps. Listen, that's all, that's exactly what I would say, actually. I mean, there's, there's, um, there's, there's one thing that, um, you know, we talked about the simplicity of message earlier on, and I think that is a, definitely a watchword for us in terms of helping you have impact. There is one thing that we like to keep in mind when we are communicating, uh, we are collateral. Uh, and and I'm, I focus on two different things here. The content, so what we want to say, but almost before that is how that's presented. So we like to think about that. And, you know, we could have, we often think of, we could have the best content in the world that we're trying to say, but if it's presented very poorly, you know, whether it's through a visual or whether it's in writing, you lose your impact of what you're saying. So, you know, we will often think about how we're going to present something before we're even thinking about the content of that. Mm -hmm. um, now, now that, you, you know, we won't always think like that, but I think it's very important that these two things go hand in hand. And that's from even a news release or a bit of communication you're sending out to a member, you know, the, how we present that is so important. If I see something, that is far too long and wordy, uh, you know, it might have the best content message in the world, but I won't read it yeah. because it puts me off. So just, you know, the way we communicate and the channels we use and how we present information is really important for us in terms of that content versus presentation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suppose it's, it's, it's knowing your audience, um, evaluating what works for that audience and, and using those tools to effectively engage them. So. Indeed. Listen, thank you both so much um, for your time this afternoon. I really appreciate it. Um, it's been really insightful and I know that we'll all have come away with lots to think about there. So um, I will close, but just a couple of things before uh, I do that. Just a reminder, if you are catching up with this event afterwards, then the uh, event is eligible for five CPD points. So be sure to log it through the CIPR system. Um, I'd also just like to remind CIPR members that the new member app, CIPR Connect, has now launched and you can download it wherever you get your apps. Uh, the new app contains news and updates, networking and discussion opportunities, and importantly, you can also register your CPD quicker and faster than ever before. Uh, this is the first event in our 2022 series, and we'll be back with another event next month. 
So do keep an eye on our group event page, which is at www.cipr.scot to see what is coming up and to register for our events and keep an eye on our Twitter at CIPR underscore Scotland. Thank you again and we look forward to seeing you then.